Coming up, we visit with a woman at the forefront of a major effort to join indigenous knowledge with Western sciences, plus major renovations for one of the oldest urban Indian centers, and self-governance, self-determination through self-governance is the only policy that's ever worked in Indian country. A look at a new economic report by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines ahead on the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands. On the web at iltf.org. Support for the ICT newscast with Alia Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. We start today in Alaska, where a decades-long battle over a proposed mine has landed at the Supreme Court. Bristol Bay, Alaska natives filed an amicus brief opposing a state of Alaska complaint to try and revive the proposed mine. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency denied a water permit for the project last January. The Bristol Bay, Alaska natives say the state of Alaska is leapfrogging over lower courts by going straight to the Supreme Court for a resolution. The proposed mine would create an open pit copper and gold mine in the headwaters of Bristol Bay. State of Alaska officials say the mine can generate billions of dollars and the EPA is overstepping Alaska state sovereignty by denying the permit. However, the EPA and the Alaska Native groups say the mine will have terrible environmental consequences at one of the world's most productive wild salmon fisheries. The Supreme Court must decide if it will hear the case. It's land back for a Nebraska tribe. Senators from two Midwestern states want land returned to the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska. The 1,600-acre tract was taken by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to stabilize the banks of the Missouri River. A plan to establish a recreation area never materialized. Currently managed as wildlife areas by the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, it was taken by eminent domain in 1970. Land on the Nebraska side has been returned to the tribe. Senators Deb Fisher and Pete Ricketts sponsored the bill with Iowa Senators Chuck Grassley and Joni Ernst. The Winnebago Land Transfer Act has been introduced in the House of Representatives from three states. Well, we move to Arizona, where a new indigenous art collective is being formed. The art collective known as Haiku will be working with the city of Tempe to make public art and design installations. The installations will be used to show the cultural history of the Autumn, Pipash, Pisc and Pascoyaki tribes in an urban environment. The project is based on what the group calls the Oibad, or Original People's Design Principles, and emphasizes the presence of the original people of Tempe and its surrounding lands. Those principles are ancestral presence, culturally significant sites, natural environment, and creative expression. Haiku is a partnership between various tribal community citizens and the National Endowment of Arts with Our Town Grant. And those are the headlines for the ICT newscast. We head out now to Yuma, Arizona, where that city's campus of Northern Arizona University is home to a groundbreaking science center. It's the Center for Braiding Indigenous Knowledge and Science. Oramaric Martinez is part of this major effort to further spread these essential understandings. Oh, the CBIX is what we're calling it for short. So Center for Braiding Indigenous Knowledge and Science um, really aims to be transformational by connecting or really by braiding indigenous knowledges and Western knowledges and more specifically sciences. We are really concerned about 
our environment and the impact of climate change on our homelands, on our indigenous homelands, but also across the world, right? We're seeing these impacts. Um, we're also concerned about the protection of our heritage places and our sacred places. Um, and finally, we are extremely concerned about our food system. So our water, our our land, right? And so the CBICS is really our attempt to reconcile these issues and address these issues with indigenous knowledges and, and by braiding these knowledges with Western science, scientific approaches. And so really we've seen, um, you know, the, the development of Western science and um, the almost the total replacement of indigenous knowledges and indigenous sciences. And so what we're, what we're really trying to do is create a place within Western educational institutions for indigenous knowledges to be able to show students how to do this, how to braid, um, but also in in bringing more indigenous folks and in, indigenous communities into STEM work so that they are able to do this work on their own. So addressing climate change, um, protecting our sacred places, our heritage places, and protecting our water, our air, the earth, right? All of these systems that work together symbiotically to to provide for us, right? And so our NSF um, Science and Technology Center is really going to show or be able to create that pathway for us. This is the first time that this work has been completed within an educational system or structure. And so we're really excited about that because we know that our communities and our people have been doing this for thousands of years. That's why we're still here. And so really it's about bringing this knowledge into educational spaces and teaching and sharing and showing what our, our knowledges have done and have been able to do for since time immemorial, right? And, and really being able to address these three areas in a way that is collaborative, but is steeped in our own cultural understandings of the world. Um, but more importantly, being able to take that knowledge and and share it, translate it and share it out. So sharing out through, you know, our educational systems, but also in ways that we have always shared knowledge through storytelling, through song and prayer and dance. And so the way that we are going to share information is going to be in line with our traditional lines of cultural transmission. Um, and so really being able to indigenize the way that we do science, indigenizing how we share information out. Um, and I think that's one of the one of the major issues that underlies this um, lack of indigenous perspectives and approaches in science anyway, in STEM, in STEM facing disciplines anyway, is um, this practice of Western science and scientists to relegate indigenous knowledges to myth or superstition um, and, and believing that there is, is not a scientific approach there. And like I said before, our people have been doing science. They have their own scientific approaches and methods that they have been utilizing since time immemorial. And so they know science, science is a part of them. Um, and so again, making space for that within Western institutions, within institutions of higher education. Um, but we're really hoping as well to make impacts to policy, um, policy at the federal level, at the state and local levels, um, and really being able to see the way that indigenous knowledges can impact and influence the way that we care for the earth, right? Care for these, um, for our elements. It is the, the first uh, National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center grant that has been awarded to an indigenous facing project. And, and you know, this is something that Many of us as Indigenous scholars have been pushing for. I went to school for my PhD in the early 2000s and wrote um, a proposal to have my dissertation funded that looked at what would a Navajo-facing archaeology look like 
um, and unfortunately wasn't funded because my work wasn't perceived as being scientific. There's this bias against indigenous knowledges that has always existed, I think, since, um, you know, looking historically, right, at the the way that indigenous peoples, Native Americans have been characterized, um, studied and identified by anthropologists and archaeologists, right? It, it, we've been perceived as sort of backwards or, or not having the intellectual capability of doing these things. And so that's something, a stereotype that has carried on and has impacted our ability to show to, to really demonstrate what we can do and what our knowledge knowledges are capable of. Um, and so again, this is, you know, uh, the first time I would say that NSF has supported something um, as indigenous as this. One of the first urban Indian centers is closed for a major renovation. Since 1975, the Minneapolis American Indian Center has been the gathering place for 35,000 tribal members who call the Twin Cities their home. ICT Shirley Snavy toured the construction site. Mary Lagarde is the executive director. Take a look. Since 1975, this Twin Cities landmark has been the gathering place for 35,000 community members. A renovation has been in the works for years. Well, officially, we launched the campaign in 2019. That's, that's when we officially launched our capital campaign. But, um, you know, years before that, you know, back to 2013 um, is really when we started the initial process with the community, um, envisioning what what the community wanted the Indian Center to be. Um, you know, for years it had been uh, very heavily social services. Um, prior to that, um, it was, you know, heavily arts, culture, recreation. And so really finding that balance um, and listening to the community. And it, it all pointed to the building um, and, you know, how better we could use um, our existing building and came to an expansion. So, um, you know, we have, we started the process in 2013 with the community. Um, it was in 2017 that we had received um, pre-designed dollars through the Minnesota State Legislature and started the pre-design process. Um, from there, um, we went into full design and launched the campaign in, in 2019 after securing um, the initial $5 million cash appropriation from the state of Minnesota. I asked Mary what the overall cost of the project is. Um, the overall cost of the project is $35 million. Um, and of that, um, we are at $32 million. Um, and so we are very close to um, reaching our goal of 35 million. It's been a learning process for me and, you know, for this particular project, putting all putting together all of these different funding sources um, has really been a funding puzzle. Um, you know, we've had a federal appropriation. Um, we have state appropriations, new market tax credits, um, along with so many different foundations and others that um, have contributed to the project. So. Um, it, it's been a learning process all around for me. Um, I'd never undertaken um, something like this. Um, and, you know, I, I think that what I learned um, is that um, to get those consultants that, that you need and others um, on board so that you don't overwhelm yourself. <laughs> yeah, and, and, it, and the community I know is really excited um, for, the, for the reopening of the center. Um, since we've been closed, it has been so hard to have, you know, all of our, our big um, events and celebrations um, that we normally have um, utilizing our gymnasium for sports events and activities. Um, and so I know that, that this has been um, greatly missed by the community, by our own staff, um, all of us since, since we're not in the building um, now and in temporary locations. Um, but it will be um, 
once once it's done and open to the community, it will be here for generations to come. That that is my goal. Back in 1975, this this was um, the center, um, and since that time, there they had undergone one um, one capital campaign, but really fell short of what their goal was. Um, it would happen during the time of recession, um, and so at that time, that was probably about 15 or 20 years ago, um, it really was just putting band-aids um, on all of the problems. And this time we've been able to do it right um, and get to the core of what those issues were with the building, um, and then also make it more um, functional for our community members. So um, on the first floor then we'll all be um, community access um, to programs. And then up on the second floor um, will be offices and areas for staff and a co-working office area. The history of the American Indian Movement will be remembered at the center. Um, and that, that, that's our intent. So the, um, before, before Clyde Belcourt passed on, um, he had talked with me um, about having the archives here of the movement. And um, and so I agreed to that and met him at a storage facility <laughs> to, to gather what we could um, to bring back to the center and then other items went to the University of Minnesota to be cataloged. Um, and once we are complete, um, you know, my hope is that all of those records will come back to the Indian Center. Um, so this will be the um, place where all of those important documents, historic documents, um, are held. The Minneapolis American Indian Center is one of several groups that serve Native people in the region. And we do a lot, um, have a lot of different programs and services um, in the community for the community, um, but we don't do everything. You know, there's so many other of our Native organizations that um, that contribute to, you know, all of the resources um, and um, I don't know what else, but I mean, just contributing um, to what the community really needs. And so it's not just the center, but I mean, we're more than happy to, to partner and collaborate with all of our other Native organizations to ensure that, um, you know, that there's services and resources for our community. Reporting from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Shirley Snavy, ICT News. The grand opening for the center is set for May 1st. It starts American Indian Month in Minnesota. Normally, journalists just cover the story but I'm also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and I was asked to participate in a three-year project, the Commission on Reimagining the Economy. Our final report came out last week. I talked to another member of the panel, Megan Minoka Hill. She is a senior director of the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. Welcome, Megan. We're talking about the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and its Commission on Reimagining the Economy. And maybe just start with kind of the big picture takeaway from this report. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, at the heart of the, the commission and ultimately the report was the idea that too much time is spent focused on how the economy is doing and not really on how people are doing, on how um, Americans are doing. And so that was really sort of the driving force behind it. This is such an interesting time for that because we're going through so many dramatic changes, whether you're in office, but so many people are not now. Yeah. And and that alone is kind of changing our conversation. Yeah, changing our interpersonal dynamics and sort of how we engage with the world and relationships. And, um, you know, the commission was really interesting. As you said, you were on it. The, the composition was pretty unique. It had voices from multiple sectors that often don't come together. And so I thought that was um, really critical. Um, I know you've participated on a number of listening sessions to hear from, from people themselves, from Indian country um, itself on, on what their thoughts were. And, and then there was sort of development of what was called a core score, which looked at sort of different metrics focused on um, 
uh, economic security and economic opportunity and um, political voice and, and health. And so things that normally don't necessarily have a specific focus on and certainly aren't focused on collectively. I know you worked very hard on making sure that indigenous voices were represented in the commission and in the in the proposals that uh, come out of that. Maybe talk about those for a minute. Yeah, as did you. <laughs> I think it was it was really uh, great to have two natives on on that commission because oftentimes there are no natives and so hopefully next time around there'll be even more. Um, yeah, I think um, the the report is 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 um, divided into three sections. So the first section is focused on security, and um, the second section is opportunity and mobility, and and the third section is democracy. And so. Um, of those three sections, there's 15 recommendations, and one is really focused on um, Indian country and the importance of um, self-determination and institution building um, in relation to um, nation well-being, community well-being, and, and health. And so that's embedded in the, in the democracy section, and I think is, is really core. And there was a second proposal. Um that talked about some of the mechanics of this. Yeah, so, I mean, I think you and I both know, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people listening know that um, self-governance, uh, self-determination through self-governance is the only policy that's ever worked in Indian country to sort of tackle some of these issues of um, economic and social well-being and 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 um, indigenous nation rebuilding in, in many cases. And so, that was sort of the the core thinking and and really trying to help um, you know our neighbors and partners whether in the the federal government the state government or even philanthropy sort of understand that core piece to Indian country and and the necessity to um, one understand it but two um, uh, focus funding needs and and that sort of thing in those areas um, focused at tribal self determination so that tribes themselves are are not only sort of expressing their own priorities on their own terms, but but able to um, make those reality. One of the things that uh, comes through for me is there's so often a narrative of either poverty or great wealth. And in this, it shows kind of the um, complexity that it's a lot of both, a lot of other things and how significant tribal nations are to a larger economy. Oh, absolutely. I think it's so funny because, you know, oftentimes Indian country, Indian people, tribal nations fall at the bottom of, of whatever matrix and whatever spectrum, but but it's not never the full story. Um, you know, we um oftentimes I think success is measured differently. It's it's about community health, whether it's you know the development of an elder care facility or language retention, or you know, it's not focused on sort of that individual. Um, bank account. It's it's about sort of the the whole in the community. But secondly, what we know is in rural America, Indian tribes are both the economic and social service drivers of the region. And so there's this real rising tide that um, tribal nations when they when tribal nations do well, everybody does well. Um, that just just doesn't st stop at, at the reservation borders. And so um, it's it's everything again from sort of social services to jobs, job creation. And so Indian country fills a really, really critical role in the, in the health of rural America. And um, well. There, there are just so many either counties or regions of the state where tribes are the largest employers. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's funny because, um, you know, sort of embedded in this recommendation, you know, there's a, there's a note on, on taxation and that, um, tribal nations don't have the full powers of taxation, which is interesting because they are responsible for the full array of, of services that any sort of state or local government are responsible for, for, from, you know, trash collection to road maintenance to educational curriculum, de curriculum development, whatever that is, yet they don't have a tax base necessarily to rely on for that. And so there is this sort of extra burden placed on tribal nations where to fund those things, they have to then um, utilize, you know, um, tribal re tribal um, resources from tribal enterprises and things like that. And so 
so there's, I think in the, in addition to sort of the recognition of self-determined nation and self-governance is sort of that institution building um, within um, tribal governments. Well, thank you very much. This is really interesting and I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks so much, Mark. The full report can be found at the Academy's website, amacad.org. I've also written a story that is posted today at ictnews.org with more details about the report. ICT invites you to be part of something special. Each week we're taking on a different topic important to indigenous people and you, our viewers and readers. Find the link at ictnews.org to sign up for the e-weekly newsletter. It's emailed on Thursday and we're covering food, business, economic development, and arts and culture. And for December, we're working on a very special holiday edition on the web at ictnews.org. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. a private corporation funded by the American people.